Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Um, I, uh, I want to, I want to share something with you first before we start <coughs> in chapter 15 of Matthew, but, um, to share my personal experience in, uh, my walk of faith, which for the most part has been pretty isolated. Um, and I've mentioned that to you before. From time to time, I've attempted to enter into fellowship uh, with the brethren uh, from different uh, flavors of the Christian faith. And um, it all seems to be focused, for the most part, on their Sunday worship and or with some uh, fellowships Wednesday or Thursday Bible study. And uh, I always wanted more than that. I, you know, when I read the scriptures about our coming together, okay, and it says, don't you have homes to do this, that he was making reference to our study and worship, okay, uh, before the throne of God in our own home that when we came together as a group that it was for the fellowship and the love of the brother not for worship servant <laughs> okay this is not to say amen Jesus that I don't see the uh, place for praise and worship periods of time amen in and among the fellowship that you're having with the brethren but I, I just don't see I don't see reserving one day a week, okay, and, and most believers, true believers, spend more than one day a week in study of the Word of God and in, in praise of worship uh, of God. So uh, the idea that for me to set aside one day where I would enter into that kind of a relationship with people to me is is what the basis of religion is okay that's that's the religious to me is the religious whore it, it doesn't have anything to do with any particular faith but all of them in general okay have this religious formality by which they lead their flocks and to me that religious formality is the whore Okay? So, I don't have nothing to do with it. Alright? But, you know, there's a saying that you, you bite your nose to spite your face. And so what had, has happened over the years as a result of that is that I ended up with no fellowship at all. Okay? <laughs> and uh, that doesn't work either. Because it's a very lonely path to be isolated and separated from any kind of fellowship with other brothers and sisters in the Lord. So I've come to the conclusion that if it's possible, amen, Jesus, I am going to begin to pursue just the fellowship aspect that is being offered out here among these many gatherings and see if I can't just fit in that way in among the brethren, name of Jesus, for when they're having dinners or get-togethers outside of that religious formality of Sunday worship and or Wednesday and Thursday Bible study, okay? That aspect I want to separate myself from and keep myself separated from, but at the same time I want to enter into that love feast among the brethren, okay? Because we, I need it, I don't know about the rest of you, but I need to be among other brothers and sisters in, in love, in that feast of love, sharing with one another. So uh, that's what I'm going to begin to pursue in my own life. And I, uh, since I, by the grace of God, uh, due to retirement and stuff, uh, 
I have more time on my hand to do that. And I want to devote myself wholly into that area. Uh, whatever the outcome is, amen, Jesus. Thank you, Father. My hope is, is the unity of the brethren in love, okay? Uh, that's my hope. So that we start to come together now in that love and not into a religious ceremony or service of which, okay, to me amounts to nothing. But uh, it's the activity that takes place in among the fellowship of the brethren. To me, that's where the work and the will of the Father takes place. In our one-on-one, -on -one, face to face daily activities and conversation with one another. That, to me, is the restoration of the church. So, it's my hope that we might even end up with a fellowship hall. <laughs> of which, in my heart, I believe is the house of prayer uh, for all nations, okay? <laughs> which we don't seem to have. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to give you that today um, to let you know where I'm at. I was going to give you a little bit of breakdown on what took place in my, in my week, okay? And, but... I don't think it's really necessary today to do that, but uh, it, I'm going to start to do that more. I, because that's the, the, to me it's the essence of the, the the sharing, okay, of one another's burdens and or joys. I mean, everything that the Word has explained to us to do, it seems like we're not doing. And everything that the Word told us not to do, we we seem to do. And. I just can't live in that hypocrisy. I can't, I can't be a part of that in myself or in and among others. Amen, Jesus? So somewhere along the line, you just got to say, okay, uh, that's it. I, I got to take a stand now. Amen, Jesus? Regarding my own place, okay, in the kingdom before the throne of God. Regardless of what anybody else does, I'm responsible to be led by the Spirit of God according to the work and the will of the Father as I have come to understand it to be. So praise God. Chapter 15, amen, Jesus, of Matthew. We'll probably do a double portion today and or Saturday, one of the two, because I really believe that, uh, you know, I, I, it's not a law in the sense that uh, any more than, than we should come together every Sunday. And as, as I've tried to share with you before, we do what we can, when we can, for who we can, regardless of who they are. Okay? But more than any, obviously, he meant for us to care for one another in the church, that we lay down our lives for one another. It does not mean that that's where it stops, that it should the overflow of that love should go out into the community to as many as have need. There's no question there. <clears throat> but when it comes to our obedience to God's laws from our heart, being led by the Spirit of God, it's my belief that the Spirit of God would not lead us any place that is not in the fulfilling of the righteousness of that law. And I guess it's a roundabout way of coming to you and saying to you that I most definitely believe that the first, uh, uh, the last day of the week, and God's week, okay, is Saturday. And that the first day of God's week is Sunday. And as I've shared with you before, I believe the brethren, for the sake, uh, like Paul said, to all men, all things, that they both gathered themselves together on Saturday as well as on the first day of the week with those who were not under the law. That they did both. So for the sake of those who are under the law, I'm wanting to do my service to the Father on Saturday. Now I do believe we are children of the day, so although it may begin on Friday evening, we are children of the light. Come nighttime, 
Amen, Jesus. We ought not be out there unless we have to be out there. Okay, we have jobs or something like that. Come evening time, fall, we got no business being out there. Amen, Jesus? We should be in our homes. Now what you do on Friday evening after your week is done, you sit around with your family, whatever it is, that's between you and God. But on Saturday morning, and all of the day of Saturday, I believe that we should be devoting ourselves to prayer and fellowship. Okay? Not just on Saturday for the hundredfold. Okay? But Saturday and Sunday to fulfill the righteousness of the law. Both for those who are under the law and those who are not. Okay? So that's what I consider the double portion. <laughs> okay? Saturday and Sunday. So, that's that's my pursuit. You can do what you choose. I, 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 I'm not here to try to convince anybody of anything. I simply want you to come to understand my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The one I've come to know and understand. Okay? And my God and Father. Yahweh. <coughs> so, chapter 15, amen. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. These are pretty some deep sayings and you really have to spend some time sitting down and understanding some background regarding the traditions of that day and those people in order to really understand what he's going into. We're going to muddle through this, okay, and hopefully the Holy Spirit will, okay, uh, give us a word of knowledge regarding that. Um, then he, then he need not, okay, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. So, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me. Now you see, many people, I want to stop right now and say that uh, we take the Lord's name in vain, and they, they think that's a cursing, saying GD, or Jesus Christ, you know, Baba, in a angry tone of voice, that these are okay. Taking that—that's what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. But that's not what's being said here. He's not telling us that. That's the cardinal understanding of what taking the Lord's name in vain means. Here's the spiritual understanding of what. It means to take the Lord's name in vain. We worship in vanity, in the vanity of our mind, in vainness, to no purpose, to no outcome. For us to come together and to give praise and worship to God for no outcome is to worship Him vainly, purposelessly. 
but their hearts, heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles the man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know what the Pharisees were offended? Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. <clears throat> they are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both fall into a ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. My sister, uh, praise God, uh, Nancy Tibbet uh, made a little vi uh, video here about the treasures of the heart. And she's making reference also to what we're sharing here today, right now. For out of the heart proceeds, proceeds evil thought, murderers, adulterers, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Then Jesus went out from there in part and departed, to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and sent, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's some cold-hearted stuff, isn't it? This woman screaming and crying out to him. Save my daughter. She's demon-possessed. His answer is, it said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he ignored her. But here we go. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Unbeliever. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as your desire. Amen? And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Jesus departed from there, <clears throat> skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled. When they saw the mute speaking, the maimed, maimed whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, 
and they glorified the God of Israel. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me. I want you to listen to this because to me, this brings us into the revelation of the body of Christ. I want you to listen to what Jesus is saying, but I want you to listen to it in the spiritual content of his revealing something. Because he didn't share anything that he was not revealing something to us. Much of what still has not come to our understanding. Fully. Because we are in the in part ministry. But so we'll, there will be parts that we can shed some light on. Or the light can be shed upon. And I believe this is one of them. <laughs> now Jesus called to his uh, disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days. One, two, the dawning of the third day. This is what I believe he's making reference to. <clears throat> I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Then the disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness? You see, wilderness. In the wilderness travel. Two thousand years. Where could we get enough bread in this wilderness travel? Amen. Although he's referring, although it's taking place right then and there, Jesus is a prophet of God. Everything about what he did was an expression of the Word of God. The prophetic utterances for generation after generation after generation, right until the end of time, lo, I am with you always. So he is the eternal Word of God. When he's speaking here, he is just speaking the eternal Word of God, which is eternally true. Not just for that day, but forevermore. For as long as day is day. Until the end. Where would we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? Here he goes again with these loaves. <laughs> you, you can't keep ignoring this emphasis that he's making on these loaves of bread, amen, as the master, teacher, eternal word. He's not emphasizing these things just to try to make you think he's wise or something. There's a point, there's a purpose. He does not vainly worship God the Father, trust me. <laughs> amen, Jesus. Father God, how many loaves do you have? And they said, now it's seven. Okay, how many churches? Oops, seven. Seven churches. Could these seven loaves be the seven churches? I don't know. Let's see. And a few little fishes. Now this time it's not two fish. It's a few little fishes. Now, I will, as we go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to see there's a variation, but in general, okay? <clears throat> okay. Now, I, I believe in this particular verse, he's referring to the fact that, first of all, in the first one, there were two fishes and five loaves, I believe. And uh, five being faith and two being the witness of the Holy Spirit. In this one, we're seeing the seven churches and a few fishes, which to me are the witnesses. Ye are my witnesses. So when he refers to a few fishes, he's now showing us the seven churches and the witnesses. Ye are my witnesses in and among the seven churches. Okay. That's my take on it in the Revelation. Okay. 
So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, break them, and gave them to his disciples. And the disciples gave uh, to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up the seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who, were, who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And he sent away the multitude, got into the boat, and came to the region of Magdala. Now, there's <laughs> there are going to be other writings in here about this same story where he actually says uh, to the uh, disciples, set them in groups, okay? I believe of 50 or 100. And it's, to me, that's a beautiful picture of the revelation in the end times of which we are gathered together, captains of the 50s and captains of the 100s, and this final feeding which going to take place because I believe that the number represents the aspect of the period of time, either the establishing of the church, which either is the 4,000 or the 5,000, and those of you who have some spiritual discernment in the Word of God in rightly dividing what is being taken, you may want to go into prayer about this and ask the Father about this, but it's my belief that one of those two represents the establishing, either the 5,000 being gathered together or the 4,000, I think it's the 5,000 because to me it's the establishing of the faith, 5,000. And there were how many baskets gathered together at the end? But 12, which represents the 12 apostles. So to me, it, it's more likely that that particular feeding, the first one of the 5,000, would make sense and line up with the fact that the first thing that took place with the establishing of the church was the apostleship that went forth after Jesus and the resurrection, and they were established as the apostles of the church. Okay? And so the remnant, or the, you know, the fragments of the 12, 12 baskets, amen, Jesus, represent the 12 apostles and the gathering of the faithful in the establishing of the church. <coughs> Whereas the 4,000, for, for me, represents unity. Okay? And when you have a zeros, Three zeros, it's completion, spirit, soul, and body, okay? <clears throat> so the completed work of both establishing the faith and of the finished work, 4,000, three zeros, okay, is now being represented in wherein we have the seven loaves of bread, which represent the seven churches or the seven candlesticks. Amen, Jesus? Okay. And a few fishes. So now we're talking about, as I've already said and mentioned, the witnesses. Those who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, ye are my witnesses. A few. So you need to keep an eye on that. Many are called, but few are chosen. Okay? So the few, I believe, are the sons and daughters of God that he's making reference to in this final gathering which is about to take place. And he's showing it to us in these parables. Okay? Okay. <laughs> now those that ate were about 4,000. Okay, chapter 16. All right, let's go to... I don't know. I spent so much time there getting started with this. I, I, uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather not try to rush, and I don't want to hold you guys too long, because I know, you know, 15, 20 minutes is a long time for some people nowadays. Amen, <laughs> Jesus. So, I uh, love you guys, and the Lord be with you and bless you. I'll be out here, Lord willing, again this afternoon. Uh, because what I, I think I'd like to try to share at least twice, both on Friday uh, or Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so we got a, a double, double portion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.